Support for Winfluence and all the shows on the Marketing Podcast Network is provided by Storyblock. There's no better way to future-proof your business than switch to a headless content management system. That means one place to update all your digital content. 82% of those who have switched to a headless CMS like Storyblock report better productivity, efficiency, and revenue. Sign up for a free account to test and see for yourself at storyblock.com slash Winfluence. That's storyblock without the C dot com slash Winfluence. Hey gang, LinkedIn is number one in B2B display advertising in the U.S. And using LinkedIn advertising gives you a great advantage. You can stand out against your competitors while nurturing customer relationships and growing your brand. LinkedIn's targeting tools allow you to reach your precise audience down to their job title, company name, location, and more. That means your ads are being seen by those who matter. Scale your marketing, grow your business with LinkedIn advertising. As a thank you to their customers for helping them grow three times faster than the competition and just for listening to Winfluence, LinkedIn is offering a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash Winfluence. That's right. LinkedIn.com slash Winfluence just for you to claim that credit. LinkedIn.com slash Winfluence. A hundred bucks in free ads? I'm down. On this episode of Winfluence. Well, I guess is more of the problem. Brands don't offer creators of color as much money as their white counterparts or that they don't offer creators of color as many opportunities. Opportunities. I would definitely say opportunities are short. A lot of white creators get longer brand partnerships. They get a lot. They get more repeat partnerships. There's a difference between being an influencer and actually influencing. I'm Jason Falls, and in this podcast, we explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate that difference. Welcome to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. According to the State of Influencer Marketing Report from Isaiah, black creators on average make more than white influencers. But find a black creator that thinks that's accurate and you might be the first. In fact, other studies and surveys show the influencer pay gap through the filter of race is still very far from equitable. But the influencer pay gap isn't as simple as creators should be paid the same fee for the same work. Our world is not that easy. Yes, all things being equal, equal pay for equal work is right, but no influencer has the same amount of followers, the same level of content creativity, the same audience makeup. No two creators or influencers are equal, so fair pay for the same work isn't easy math. Still, we have to continue to talk about the issue so we can get closer to fair and equitable pay for all creators, regardless of, but also with respect to, race. LaToya Shambo was a media buyer at an agency back in the mid-2000-teens. She had an idea to create a black blogger network, but at the time when blogs were losing their muster and platforms like Snapchat and Instagram were emerging. She founded Black Girl Digital in 2016 and started building a network of influencers of color. It started as black women-focused, but expanded to inclusivity involving men, LGBTQ plus creators, Asian influencers, and others of color. Shambo's mission is to create opportunities for these creators. I'll call them minority creators just as a broad label, but to create opportunities for them to monetize their content, build relationships with brands, and yes, close that influencer pay gap. She deals with brands and creators every day. She sees the gap from the front line. She fights against brands who don't pay influencers fairly, whether they realize it or not. And she has some ideas on how we can all work together to rid the industry of this practice. Shambo and I caught up recently after a whirlwind media blitz for her. She's been featured recently on Adweek, Bloomberg, Marketplace, Jezebel. But she stopped to chat with Winfluence, and we'll all be the better for it today on the show. Before we get to LaToya Shambo and the Influencer Pay Gap, I want to touch on two fantastic supporters of Winfluence today. You've heard me talk about Tagger quite a bit on this show. That's because they are our presenting sponsor. Tagger is a complete influencer marketing software solution. With it, you can find, prioritize, connect and collaborate with, measure, and even pay the content creators you use for your influencer programs. I could go on, but you know I use it. You should check it out too. It might be right for your brand or agency. Go to jason.online slash Tagger to get a free demo and see if Tagger is right for you. That's jason.online 
slash tagger. And you may have heard me talking about LinkedIn before the show, or maybe during the breaks lately. That's because LinkedIn has partnered with us on Winfluence to offer you a $100 advertising credit to get your message in front of the right kind of decision makers. I use LinkedIn advertising to target leads based on job descriptions, companies, seniority, industry, and more. That means I'm not wasting advertising spend getting my message in front of people who are not my ideal customer. You can too. LinkedIn is offering you, listeners of Winfluence, you get a $100 ad credit just for listening to this podcast. Go to linkedin.com slash Winfluence today. That's right. LinkedIn.com slash Winfluence. A hundred bucks in free ad credits. Uh, yes, please. LinkedIn.com slash Winfluence. Is the influencer pay gap closing? Is there really any good way to know? We'll ask those questions and more of Black Girl Digital's Latoya Shambo next on Winfluence. So LaToya, I want to dive right in and talk influencer pay gap. I know addressing that was kind of the whole reason you started your company, Black Girl Digital, and I want to hear that story. But first, I want to share some recent stats with you and get your reaction to them. Um, According to Isaiah's State of Equality report from February of this year, uh, for the calendar year 2021, African-American creators were paid almost $500 more per post than their white counterparts. Now, I'm not foolish enough to think that that's all-encompassing and definitive. One company's sample is just that. It's a sample. But are we making progress on the pay gap in terms of race? Yes. I do think that we are making progress in terms of more people of color getting brand deals, getting good brand deals. I will caveat and say that it is situational from platform to platform, agency to agency, brand to brand. Um, Zencasters, again, basing it on the amount of, you know, campaigns that was run on from their platform. Um, I could say the same, but I only, you know, we only work with campaigns that involve people of color. So it's really situational and it's challenging to even measure. I think that um, where it, it gets tricky is where brands are reaching directly out to influencers and relying on solely on their rates. So if a white influencer says, well, my rate is $20,000 and the black influencer says, well, my rate is $5,000, the brand is going to pay them based on what they say that they've requested. So that's where it gets really tricky. So how do you solve for that? Because, I mean, obviously, I think there's there needs to be an education probably on, you know, every side of the aisle, not one side or the other. But in that situation, I would say, well, we need to make sure that the black creators are educated to know what a good going rate is. But I think we also need the brands and creators in general to understand what good going rates are. And that seems like a, a, a Pandora's box. It is because everyone values things differently, right? You know, you either value production or you value the audience or you value the strategy. So it's it's hard to say the budget should be this and that's it. I think that there are a lot of variables that come into play uh, when when the way that we structure our deals, we make sure that everything is just equal. You know, if we're working with 10 micro influencers, everyone is getting paid generally the same regardless of your rate. Um, But that's because it's our mission. Our mission is to get more people of color paid fairly, you know, but that's not everyone's mission the way that we have it set up. So again, we do take into consideration all the different variables, but it's hard to standardize when the brand might view the audience as the value or the agency might view the production as the value and they'll pay based on what they view as value. They'll pay more, a premium, you know, so it's just hard to standardize. 
Yeah, it's true. It is, you know, still everybody throws around the term. It's it's the Wild West, and it really yeah. is in a lot of ways. But but the reason I actually posed that original question about Isaiah's research was because we, you know, we talk about a pay gap and we see a report like that. Then I look at the average pay. I saw another report recently. The average pay for a female influencer in beauty and fashion is like five times that of male creators in that vertical. Yet male creators in food and lifestyle and other verticals make more than women. So is it even possible to talk about pay gaps in general when there's so many inconsistencies, not just from vertical to vertical, but as you said, from sort of, you know, output to output? It's, it is a challenging conversation overall. I think that the origin, the origination of the conversation really stemmed from the, the start of the industry, right? Where it was a proven fact because um, on this platform, the pay gap, I think it is called the pay gap, where the creators were actually posting vis- visible this is what I was offered for this versus what she was offered for that. And it's, it was really clear that the white people versus the black people were getting paid more for the deals. But now as, again, as the deals are maturing and brands are seeing the value, sure, there are shifts in who's getting paid what, how much, but again, it's just hard to track Overall, you know, again, wh- whether it's the fashion industry, the food industry, males, females, BIPOC, it's really challenging. That the conversation is still just around the origination of where the gap, where that gap, pay gap conversation was coming from. I, I know that's like no, not the uh, the best answer, but it's just again, it's really hard <laughs> when you're trying to to manage wild wild west it's really hard yeah it's 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 hurting cats infinitely you know exponentially more than actually hurting cats in a lot of ways so (laughs) what do you see in your day-to-day in in the the day-in day-out work that you do that tells you a the gap is still there and there's still work to be done so what i'm hearing i'm in a lot of different influencer groups and you know, I just listen. I frequent Clubhouse a lot, still just listening. And what I'm hearing is that there is still a huge pay gap. Um, There's still a lot of brands asking creators to do, especially Black creators, to do things for free in exchange for product. And I 150% stand against doing free work. I don't think that I don't, it doesn't even matter how many followers you have, you know, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of effort to create content. And at the very least, somebody can pay you a hundred dollars at the very least. Like you want something in exchange for something, a hundred dollars is like the bare minimum, you know? Um, So there's still chatter around, um, influencers getting paid far less than what they're worth. Um, but I do think that on the, on the other end, because I see it from both sides, I do hear and I do see brands trying to make an effort and, you know, trying to pay influencers more. But it's just the way the media business works. Sometimes the budget is just spread thin. And it's just imbalanced or they're shifting budgets to a different medium. So not a, not enough influencers are being um, utilized in a, in a campaign, but that's really the way the cookie crumbles. So is it, is the problem, it's interesting that you say that is the problem that brands is, well, I guess is more of the problem. Brands don't offer creators of color as much money as their white counterparts or that they don't offer creators of color as many opportunities. Opportunities. Hmm. Interesting. I would definitely say opportunities um, are short. I think that a lot of white creators get longer brand partnerships. Um, They get a lot, they get more repeat partnerships. Um, And this is just from my, my basic research. You know, I can, I can see where when a white creator is, they have a long deal. 
because you're, mm-hmm. you're seeing that create, you're seeing them post about it over and over. Mm-hmm. And sure, sometimes it perhaps it's organic, but the way the way that they kind of run and operate their business, it's a long term partnership, you know, and that's really where um, I'm pushing a lot of brands is figuring out what that long term partnership would look like working with um, creators of color. So it's not performative or just a transactional campaign. Sure. So uh, on that note, I want to play the role uh, of ignorant white guy for a moment. I, I don't consider myself that, but mm-hmm. though I, I, I do recognize I still have a lot to learn. I always do. But I know there are some, let's say, underinformed or non-enlightened folks out there who look at racial breakdowns in population. So 58 percent of America is white and 16 percent Hispanic and 15 percent is African-American. And they say that that's their guide. They try to ensure the same statistical breakdown and the mm-hmm. opportunities they offer. I personally don't like that approach, but I want to ask you, is there something wrong with that thinking? Is, is that good or bad for someone to say, well, demographically? I match up. Demographically, in terms of how they're divvying up their media spend. Yeah. I think that the approach, because there's no right or wrong. There's no right or wrong. Just however you decide you want to spend your media dollars is your prerogative. However, I think that at the very least, having a strategy that is all inclusive, having a media investment strategy that is all inclusive is what's important. You know, I, if it's approached from a perspective of, um, if one creator, let's say if one creator per demo, and you're going to say you're divvying up your media spend based on the audience reach per demo, that's incorrect because then it's inequitable because obviously there's more white people in the universe than there are black people. So you're obviously that bigger media spend would go against the white demo that, but it's only one person. So it's, that's, that wouldn't be the correct approach. The correct approach is by medium, right? By channel. Sure. You're going to, you know, if you're going to, you, you want to heavy up on TV, you're going to have your influencer spend, you're going to blah, 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 blah. And then you fairly split up how you're paying people, um, but not based on their audience reach. Just pay them fairly. So if I had, let's say I had 10 uh, influencer spots, uh, as long as I paid each of the 10 equally, I could break it down just for round numbers. Six mm-hmm. you know, white creators, two Hispanics and two African-Americans in my 10. As long as I paid everybody the same now I'm being equitable. Is that reasonable? If they have the same reach, if they uh, fall under the same reach category, because okay. obviously you wouldn't pay the nano influencer the same as a mega influencer. Right. So it's really based on what is what it is that you're asking them to do and how many followers they have. I have a feeling, uh, folks, what Latoya is trying to say is we should have paid more attention in math. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is getting really complicated now. <laughs> it's it's simple. I How I see it, it's relatively simple. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I, I mean, I, I try to manage the campaigns that I manage in a way that, you know, I can basically no, say that if I'm trying to reach diverse communities – then I obviously need to produce an influencer roster of diverse creators. And I try to treat each one of them as equitable and equally as possible. But you're right. If I'm working with, let's say, an African-American creator who has a reach of 100,000 and a white creator who has a reach of 15,000, I'm not going to pay them the same. But I would flip that, too. If I have the white person with 100,000 and the African-American person with 15,000, I'm not paying them the same either. Um, just because it's, for me, it's about the effectiveness of the spend. However, as you said earlier, it might be that I value the African-American creator's content, um, not just their reach a little bit more because maybe they're a better designer, better photographer, whatever. So So I'm glad you brought that up. Okay. 
Glad you brought that up. And in in a perfect world, in my perfect world, what would be really interesting to see is um, the shift in how the industry is valuing and paying. So if, as you stated, you value the quality of the content that that Black creator is creating, then here's the production fee and here's the media fee. It can really be that simple. I, I I agree with you. And I've said before on this show several times that I really feel like when you are engaging a creator slash influencer, you're really engaging them for three things, their time, their content, and their audience. Correct. And I think it's okay to break down how you pay them in those three buckets and say, hey, we, we don't necessarily you know, value the content in terms of we don't necessarily want to use it on our channels. So maybe we pay less for the content, but we are going to pay you for your time and what you use to produce that content. And we're going to pay you for access to that audience. And you can break that down a bunch of different ways. Agreed. I agree. So, and, and I would also say this too. Um, if, if you are a brand and you want to reach and engage communities of color, you're obviously not going to do that on your own or easily. So I think, arguably, and I think, Latoya, you would probably agree with me, but I'll throw this out there and see if you do. I think creators of color maybe should come at a premium price sometimes, if that's what you're trying to do. Fair? That is fair. I didn't think you'd have any argument with that. That is fair. (laughs) It's a niche audience, you know? It is. It is. And, And especially for the brands and agencies who, you know, they come to the table with, okay, we need to make sure that we are reaching out to diverse communities. And if they don't already have a built-in mechanism, discipline, history, connection with those communities, you need to pay a premium to establish Mm -hmm. those things. And so you need to factor that into your budget as well. Absolutely. More from LaToya Shambo, including more about Black Girl Digital. That's coming up after this. So tell me about tell me about Black Girl Digital. If I'm not mistaken, you were a media planner and buyer. You come from that world and then had an epiphany to do this when you were laid up after an accident. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I definitely started out in the on the agency side doing planning buying. So I understand media holistically. Uh, but when, it was really when I was at Complex um, where I discovered the business model of ad networks. And I was like, this is how I could share revenue. OK, I, I get it. You know, and then it was just when you have time to sit in your own thoughts, regardless of the situation, beautiful things happen and beautiful things manifest and When Black Girl Digital, it just really allowed me to blend my love for the the culture that I'm engulfed in, as well as my experience and um, industry life that I just that I love. I love the advertising business, and to be able to merge them together, it brings me great joy every day. And for me, it's Black Girl Digital is truly my contribution to the culture and it'll live so much far beyond me regardless of um, if I'm here or not. So that's pretty amazing. Now, as I understand it, this, the, it started with, or you started with bloggers and ad networks, Mm -hmm. right? Tell, tell us how that evolved into what you're doing today with, with influencers. So Back in the back in the back in the day, it seemed like forever ago, but it was Be careful now. Be careful now. I was around back in the day. I don't want to feel old here. I know. It seems like forever ago, but it really was only about six years ago. Um, I really just wanted to create a Black female complex and was working with some really great bloggers. And then... It was literally, I feel like I went to sleep, woke up, and it was all about social media, all about influencers. And I was like, okay, all of my bloggers were turning into influencers and the brands, they wanted social content. And it was just easy to package up the social as well as the editorial. It was just, it worked. 
And I said, okay, well, we'll try it out for a little bit. And although, so traffic was really slowing down on the dot coms. Uh, so I said, you know what? I'm just going to focus on the influencer side because that is where the, the, the demand is. That's where the creators are spending their efforts. And I can't, I can't force creators to write more, drive more traffic and generate more traffic on their social, on their um, dot com. So I was like, all right, well, that's where you're going to hang out. I'm still going to do my part and get you the money. And it's a win win. So the pivot was natural. 2020 was 100. 2020, I said 100 percent. We're just focusing on influencers. We had our tech platform, iLinker, and it really just helped with managing the campaign and the process from start to finish. And now we have a, a huge database of over, she's over a thousand black and brown creators um, that we have access to. And it's just, it's really been beautiful. That's awesome. Now, I think it's safe to say that if a brand wants to reach, uh, you know, pri- primarily a black female audience, Black Girl Digital is a great place to start. But I know you do more than just say, here's some, you know, black female influencers and here's what they charge. Tell us more about a typical collaboration with a brand and how the agency serves companies kind of all along the process. Yeah, absolutely. So in the in the beginning of time, yes, it, the focus was around Black female influencers. However, as time evolved and the business evolved, it really allowed us to build more of an inclusive uh, operation. So now we're working with men, you know, a, the Asian community. We're working with the LGBTQ plus community. So it's really about. Um, connecting the brands and agencies to uh, diverse creators as a whole um, at scale. And that's the beauty of what we do. You know, that's why brands work with us because we're, we're managing these massive campaigns. For example, we just worked with um, Walmart on, I think we had about 30, maybe about 30 creators, um, maybe 20, 20 to 30 creators, um, at one time activating on a, on a campaign. And it's, uh, for us, it's a walk in the park where, you know, we're contracting, we're sourcing, we're vetting, and we have a, a rigorous internal vetting process. Um, we are contracting, we are uh, creating these creative briefs. We're making sure that we're talking to all of the creators and that they understand what the output needs to be, what the expect what the expectations are the standard that we're holding them to, things of that nature. Um, And we try to build out also integrated opportunities. So it's not just here's one social post, you know. So, for example, we'll do like co-branded experiences where we're hosting an event, having influencers participate, bringing the brand into the event so that they're, you know, next to the influencers. So it just, it, again, it's, we love the integrated approach so that the campaigns are a little bit more dynamic. Very nice. So I guess the next logical question is where can people find you and Black Girl Digital online if they want to learn more? <laughs> just Google us. I mean, we're <laughs> everywhere. No. <laughs> they can make a true influencer. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, but we are at www.blackgirldigital.com or feel free to email me at info at blackgirldigital.com. And, and on all the social platforms, it's very simple, blackgirldigital.com. And that's spelled as is, no, nothing fancy, nothing funky. Very nice. You have all the vowels as opposed exactly. to startup companies. Well, LaToya, thank you so much for what you're doing to make the industry a better place for Black women, but also for agencies and brands that need help knowing more and reaching them. So great to have you here today. Thank you so much, Jason, for having me. This was great. I appreciate it. We've got a long way to go, folks. But people like LaToya Shambo and conversations like this one inch us a little closer to where we need to be, I think. Thanks to LaToya and Black Girl Digital for the work they continue to do to make our industry better. Be sure to connect with her on LinkedIn and check out Black Girl Digital on all the social channels. And certainly, if you're a brand and need to diversify your creator roster, well, you know at least one good place to start. 
Folks, don't forget to drop Windfluence a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. We are on all of them, I think. Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartMedia, Podchaser, TuneIt, Pocket Casts. Are we on Pocket Casts? I think we are. Let's put it this way. If you are listening to us now, look for the stars or ratings on that app and tap or click and let us know how we're doing. I would appreciate that. Also, if you'd like to take a deep dive on influencer marketing topics every so often, subscribe to my email newsletter at jason.online slash subscribe. I send it every four to six weeks and go deep on a topic to make your influence marketing smarter. I don't abuse your inbox, just every four to six weeks or so. And I'd love for you to help make a future episode of Winfluence awesome. Ask your question about influence or influence marketing you want my answer to or take on. Send me an email to jason at jasonfalls.com. If you're feeling adventurous, record a voice memo on your phone and email me that file. I'll let you ask the question right here on the show using the recording. Regardless of how you ask it, I may use your comment on a future episode or your question to inspire a show topic. If I do, I'll send you a signed copy of Winfluence the book as a thank you. Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast, is an audio companion to my book, Winfluence, Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my periodic newsletter or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K-Club and Grammy Award-winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening, and remember, when it's not about the person, but about results, it's Winfluence. I'm Ian Trescott, here to tell you about Rockstar CMO FM. The M is the marketing and the F is the well you decide. As you wonder, does the world need another effing marketing podcast? Find out as every week I chat with friends old and new that I've met through my career from techie to CMO and share a tune, a cocktail and their marketing street knowledge. Just drop a dime into your podcasting jukebox and jive along with Rockstar CMO FM. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network.